Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, Libraries in Response now. Uh, we're starting a round three of these uh, sessions. It began in late March. Uh, the first round was more or less, you know, WTF, what's going on. Uh, <laughs> then we uh, 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 launched a round two, Libraries uh, in Response. And today we are going to kick off libraries in recovery. So mm -hmm. the idea is that it's, as we put in the, in the email, the notice, it's not too soon to start thinking about how we get through this, how we get beyond this and, and what kind of issues, what do libraries look like uh, at going forward? Is the building open and closed? Uh, how do we deal with that? So, just, you know, uh, one of these images of new satellites uh, surrounding the planet. Uh, an image, another planetary image here of uh, uh, a storm, sev seven simultaneous tropical storms on Monday. They're running out of names for these. I guess, I guess we'll get to Aaron pretty soon here. Uh, and then, of course, our old companion, the virus, uh, getting around everywhere. Uh, we make the point here about uh, whether that the virus is not the only crisis facing the planet, uh, that we have multiple crises. Uh, social just, I mean, it goes on and on. It's like a cascade of crises has been happening this year. Mm. Uh, not, uh, not without prediction, but this one also not without prediction, but they're actually happening and we can see them. What we're doing about them, of course, remains to be seen. Uh, we have a great cast. I'm gonna to try to get through this intro more quickly today uh, to allow more time. We have Vint Cerf, everyone should know Vint, uh, Crosby Kemper, the director of IMLS, and David Lankus is back with us from University of South Carolina, and uh, we're gonna have some action with these fellows today. Um, our one of our starting points here is how many people have depended on libraries for internet access. Roughly one in three adults, uh, uh, BC for uh, before COVID, uh, but they had to go to a library to access that. Now, most of them had another source of, of access, but many did not. So now, you know, it's kind of a parking lot uh, kind of a thing. Libraries are buying checkout hotspots like crazy. Uh, and trying to give them out, but there, there, there's no way they can buy 80 million of these things, and who wouldn't want one for free? So it's a, it's a classic Band-Aid. I think it's fine uh, to be able to do it, uh, given how important that service is that libraries provide. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that people are just stuck both at home and without access is just, it used to be, you know, a massive embarrassment. Now it's, it's just an intolerable connectivity crisis. So why not have the library go out towards them? Kind of the inside out idea that, uh, that we heard from Castleberry, Texas, where they were going out into the community and, and they're even deploying their own network uh, across the community. And they are trans, uh, uh, transforming their school buses into mobile hotspots and, and uh, distribution size. So one idea, and we've been working on these for a while, is uh, new access stations, whatever those look like, that include Wi-Fi at least, out in the community that are closer to people. And the idea, why not the 30,000 post offices around the country? You know, they're secure, relatively, uh, environments, electrified, they have parking lots, and uh, they could use some additional support and services, and they, you know, they're well distributed. Just an idea. Um, these access stations, think of them as a kind of a combination of a public phone, a emergency call box, an e-government kiosk, and a, and a library access point. It should be close to everybody. It should be one in every neighborhood. Um, there's the uh, the image of the you know this is what they they look like. Why not have a a library access point there? Not just not just for the internet, you know, but for all uh, public services and public information. Uh, starting with li library services, how do people access library digital services without access <laughs> and without the library? Uh, 
uh, we love this sign. We, I don't know where it was. We found it and, you know, and we think those should be all over the place, maybe a little better design, but the idea is right. Uh, even, even to have librarians go out and, you know, man these places, not, you know, it's cheaper than a bookmobile, but you know, similar idea. So let's, uh, let's get to it here. Uh, we're going to, uh, ask our three esteemed speakers to make, uh, any opening remarks they'd like, briefly, please. And then we'll go to our kind of our existential founding question about what is a library now if the building is closed. And then we'll go through these four aspects that we've identified. It's not a complete taxonomy, but it's a useful one to talk about what libraries have provided. And we might also think about these in terms of their, uh, their value to the community, you know. If the library has a certain budget, how much of that is justified by each of these? And we could add other because we've certainly forgotten something. But I would imagine that uh, digital services are just right up there, expanding massively. Internet access, kind of a critical thing. Uh, physical materials, difficult, difficult thing to do, but you know, libraries are taking it on. And then the social infrastructure aspect, which came up, uh, it was something we added later with uh, a presentation from a librarian in, in Denmark, and they pointed out the role that the library plays in the community cohesion and not to be overlooked. So we'll go through those, see how, how it looks. Uh, uh, we'll ask each to kind of address these. We'll go through these one at a time, and then we'll also let our uh, speakers interact with each other, follow up, and ask a question of each other as we go through these. So this is a first time thing for us. We like to experiment with uh, uh, esteemed guests. And so uh, here we are doing this for the first time uh, and having it more interactive. So with that, uh, I will uh, give it, hand it over to Vint to, uh, to take us out and lead us off, Vint. Uh, welcome for the first time. Very glad to have you and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Don. Uh, this is a topic of real interest to me, partly because my wife is a huge uh, library fan. I think she has half of Fairfax County Library uh, sitting in, uh, in our uh, bedroom uh, bookshelves. And I'm waiting for the library police to come and say, you know, hey, uh, we'd like to have our books back. Um, first of all, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about how the library has changed over time. Uh, everyone recognizes that it started out mostly as a place to store books and make them available. Uh, in some cases it was mobile, in other cases it was in a fixed location. Uh, but over time, as new technology has come along, the library has assimilated not only the accumulation uh, of those new technologies, but, uh, but also uh, other uh, more social aspects, for example, uh, reading clubs and other kinds of uh, uh, social uh, gatherings uh, in the community, which goes beyond simply access to, uh, to written material. And then, of course, the technologies have led to things like DVDs and other kinds of you know, VHS for a while and uh, other kinds of media, uh, in addition now to uh, internet access, both inside the library and outside by way of Wi-Fi. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the library continues to adapt, which is uh, extremely um, encouraging that, it's, uh, that the genre is capable of that adaptation to meet new needs. My guess is that uh, we may end up also wanting the library to become a kind of a place of archival memory, um, especially in the digital space. Many of you know that I run around preaching about the digital dark age and my worry about uh, maintaining uh, access to digital content. Uh, libraries and archives have historically uh, often ended up being the place of collection of last resort. Uh, the distributed nature of libraries is very attractive just for resilience and redundancy. Uh, so that's one avenue uh, one might anticipate. The big problem is uh, sustaining the library and, and uh, supporting it financially. I don't think that it gets Libraries do not, in my opinion, get nearly the credit that they should get, nor the support that they should get uh, in large measure uh, for, their, um, uh, for the value they bring uh, to communities around the world. I would like to uh, remind you of a very interesting practice that I ran into in Singapore. Uh, I was uh, in a shopping center and there was a library in the middle of the shopping center. 
And my reaction was, what's the library doing in the middle of the shopping center? And of course they said, well, first of all, people come here. And so it's convenient for them to pick up and drop off books. Uh, moreover, uh, we also have a maker space here. And so young people can get a chance to be challenged by the design and implementation of various things with 3D printers and the like. And the third point was that the shopping center got a tax break as a result of housing the library in the shopping center. So I, was, I came away thinking, wow, somebody had woven together, you know, a bunch of incentives uh, to turn this into a very clever idea. So one thing we might ask ourselves is locations for shopping or for, uh, for libraries and whether we should uh, think about uh, alternatives to the classic separate building uh, in a uh, public area. Uh, let me move just very quickly over to the internet side. You mentioned the possibility of uh, the Postal Service uh, offering internet access. I would frankly suggest to you we should not load the Postal Service with any more responsibilities than it already has right now. It's losing $23 billion a year. Uh, until we figure out how to do a better fiscal job of organizing the Postal Service, I think we should be a little careful about adding more um, unfunded mandates uh, to its to his task, but I do take the point that there are 30,000 of them and they're reachable, but I'm not sure we want to fill up their parking lots uh, with people who are uh, trying to do Wi-Fi. Sorry, Vint, uh, the, the idea was that the library, like your shopping center uh, example, that the library would be the offerer there and they would use the postal facility to do it. So not the post office itself. No, uh, understood. Um, so one thing that, by the way, that that might be interesting would be to put uh, uh, put the post office in the shopping centers because the shopping centers are being emptied out now by people shopping online. So maybe we need to repurpose those uh, facilities. Uh, Google, by the way, purchased- Joined the meeting. Sorry? No, it's uh, the system, uh, something, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, Google purchased the shopping center and cut out some of the floors and that's where it was doing its loom work initially. It needed enough room to blow up a giant balloon that now we send up into the stratosphere. Uh, let me just stop there because I could rattle on and I want to hear from everybody else. I think there are some big opportunities here for libraries to adapt to new needs. And I will say that given the current COVID-19 situation, we clearly have to uh, deal with that immediately. But uh, let's ask ourselves what the COVID-19 has uncovered in the way of utility of working from home, of working online. And uh, that is not gonna go away, even if the pandemic is over. I think our discovery of utility of this ability to work at home is important. And the ability to get to the library online is equally important. And so to the extent that we figure out how to make use of these online facilities for library, classical library purposes, that will persist well beyond the pandemic. And I think in some ways will allow a library to become even more responsive to uh, public need than it already is. So I'll stop there. No, great point there. Uh, it's a good setup for, for Crosby uh, to come on and maybe respond to that question and, and how libraries fit into this anticipated new distributed world. Sure. Yeah. L let me let me start by uh, uh, taking taking you both on with post offices. Uh, it, when I was the director of the Kansas City Public Library, we helped the post office begin its uh, uh, inevitable and needful uh, downsizing of its physical space because they they began to do uh, something they called uh, neighborhood post offices in libraries. I, 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 I'm not sure that program's gone forward in a big way, but we actually had a couple of libraries that acted as the, uh, the neighborhood post office. And then a program that does continue uh, is the, the uh, shifting of uh, passport uh, issuance uh, to libraries. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, what I would say is that post office idea is not a, a bad idea at, at, at all in terms of pushing the internet out, but also uh, distributing services through, through libraries uh, because there is a huge distribution network and in a, a universe where we're going to be much more virtual, as Vint just said, um, uh, libraries can play, I think, significant role as, as distribution centers. 
uh, of various social services uh, and other things. Now, you know, the, the let me step back a second and say, I, I see two things that happened in the library world over the last 30 years, one of which has been enormously interrupted uh, by the pandemic and the other of which has been dramatically increased. So over the last 30 years, libraries became civic centers, community centers, civic centers, the civic engagement, civic dialogue happening in libraries and the uh, um, immense array of community activities that libraries engage in with an immense array of community uh, institutions and uh, groups. Um, and that, of course, has been interrupted by the pandemic. The, the second thing that, that's happened over the last 30 years is technology. And, and uh, just what, what we're here to talk about, the, the, the growth of the internet, the growth of the technical, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the outreach on the internet of libraries to, uh, to their patrons. Um, and that's been accelerated, the growth in ebook uh, checkouts, et cetera, um, uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, of individual things that have, that have happened in that, in that direction. Our challenge going forward is to remix the two. We can't lose. Uh, it would be an enormous loss to our uh, to our communities. Enormous loss to our civilization. I think if we lost the 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 civic aspect, the bringing together, the coming together aspect of what libraries have done over the last thirty or forty years. We were even seeing the IMLS was seeing this in in museums as well. A lot of that will have to do with education, it seems to me. Uh, libraries were beginning to participate in a formal way in the educational system, career online, high school, uh, digital skill development, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but that still needs, and, and th this is certainly one of the demonstrations of what's happened, and as we're reopening or not reopening schools right now, um, in-person is really important but in-person may be redistributed. It seems to me there again is a potential role for libraries and for museums, uh, which is uh, to become part of the classroom uh, situation, distanced classrooms, socially distanced classrooms situation, as well as the online uh, aspects, the, the, the huge involvement in curricular activities and in certified skill development that's going on in, uh, in libraries and now beginning to happen in museums as well. So I think we're figuring this out, and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all uh, to this. I do think in terms of the, the connectivity problem, um, I think there's an underlying change that's happened that some of us have fought for, some of us fought against for years, the notion of the internet, broadband in particular now at this point, uh, as a utility. Um, I, think, I think that discussion is actually over now. I think you, if you walked, wandered the halls of Congress and could actually find members of Congress there right now, you would find most of them left, right, and center agreeing that the internet is a utility. Uh, and we have to find ways to get it out there. Um, we've been constricted by discussions over the regulations around E-RAID about uh, various other things that are ultimately gonna, gonna be seen as the froth on the foam on top of the much larger wave that is a wave of finding ways to get everybody connected and connected in a way uh, that's useful in their, uh, in their lives for, for healthcare, for education, for finding a job, for developing skills, for whatever it is. Um, so I think, I, I think that uh, the future is really complicated because of everything that's, uh, that's going on, really complicated. Uh, but I think in the long run, what, what we're going to do is we're going to find a lot of different ways, different in each community, to make sure that everybody is connected and connected in a way that they can, uh, uh, that it can be of use and that libraries will play a major role in that. Uh, uh, but it's going to be different than it was before the pandemic. Well, Crosby, thank you. Make a major case for uh, for libraries. You know, we talk about access just as kind of a raw commodity, but in fact, it's it's not. Uh, unless you know what to do with it, it's it's nothing. And there, you know, there are a lot of people that struggle with how to use the internet. How to work right. with well, it. and Vint knows this. Vint and I were in a socially distanced way engaged in the same project, the rollout of Google Fiber uh, in Kansas City. And one of the things that we found, that Google found, uh, is that even when Google uh, offered an incredibly inexpensive, uh, easy to to access plan uh, for being being connected in the inner city in poorer regions of the community, mostly minority, 
uh, folks wouldn't wouldn't pick up on it. We had the, the library. We actually picked up the initial initial payment for a, a lot of neighborhoods to make sure that the neighborhoods themselves were connected. And, uh, and a lot of it was understanding, some of it was financial, obviously, but a lot of it was just simply understanding and training, not being able to use uh, the internet, not understanding why it would be important. And so that there is a role for libraries, absolutely, uh, is in explaining to their communities where they are trusted, why the internet is so important, how to, how to get to the internet, how to use it, and how to use it safely and, and, and correctly. Yes, you remind me we were back then. I was just going to say we were we were in Kansas City together. We had a, a Google Hangout, I believe, uh, with Crosby and you were on, and and we were talking about this. We had all the libraries in the metro, metropolitan area talking about these very questions at the time. You were there, Ben. So uh, just a quick uh, uh, addendum uh, to uh, to what you were just saying about libraries as a public space. There are lots of other public spaces that are around and there is a, I won't say it's a movement at all, but I would say that there are examples of public spaces becoming enabled in, in New York City, for example, public spaces with Wi-Fi capability deliberately offered. In, in India, Google put Wi-Fi in the railroad stations uh, at least for a couple of years anyway, to, to see if it made a difference. And uh, we, we watched um, teachers bringing their students to the railroad station to do their homework, uh, which is uh, sort of an unusual arrangement. Um, so I think we should be thinking broadly about public spaces, uh, including the library as a public space. Uh, the two other questions I think uh, with regard to infrastructure that we might pursue in this discussion are the uh, efforts to put in satellites in low Earth orbit at uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX uh, and the Starlink system, plus others that are trying to do similar things. That introduces yet another uh, access method it's still to be determined, you know, how effective is it? Is it cost effective? Is it affordable? And so on. And then um, uh, the other thing, of course, is the 4G and the 5G evolution of mobile access uh, an increasing number of people are um, dependent on mobiles and the programming that's possible in the mobiles for access to a lot of things. And one can easily imagine borrowing a book um, from the library using your mobile. Uh, you could also imagine a mobile that's, that is able to interact with a large screen television set so that uh, you, know, you, you get a bigger screen at need or at will or at, at, uh, at, at the opportunity anyway. And so the idea of any, any surface will do and interoperability works could be another very interesting uh, development. I know we have another speaker, Don, so I should, I'll stop. Uh, so well, we can... Thank you, Vint. Uh, I'm finding that we're covering these kind of these four topics in as they become relevant and occur. I don't, I don't think we're going to go kind of slice them one by one. I think we'll just keep this going. And, uh, and we'll turn this over now to David Lankus uh, at the University of South Carolina. Uh, David? What's your feeling about how how libraries are responding? What what is what does recovery look like? What's the library of the? I mean, if we're if we're saying that this virus is not going to go away immediately, like maybe within years, and it'll beyond that, it'll there'll still be some kind of condition like this that will tend to disaggregate our clustering together uh, in person. How does the library, David, how, how does the library re rebuild itself? That's what we're trying to do today is kind of initiate a new conversation, thinking forward more rather than just in the reaction and coping. But let's, let's think about planning and, and how we go ahead. So David, David Lankus. Yeah, uh, first, uh, just to pick up a, a few issues, because I very much agree with Crosby's statement about we've been making great and amazing strides in the evolution of libraries and digital services and in social services. What we discovered with the pandemic is when we thought those were one platform we were moving forward with, we had two. And um, it's been very interesting. Some libraries have been extraordinarily agile and successful in this pandemic because they thought of them as a combined uh, Charleston Public Library. Their ebook loaning went way up and they are doing something like 2,000 virtual programs a month at this point. So they're, they're, they were ready, they were going there. Some people, uh, some libraries were, let's turn up the power on our Wi-Fi, close the doors and let, our, let them use our uh, parking lot. And that was their answer, which is insufficient. Because part of what I think about, first of all, 
Vint, um, I take your point, but I, I want to make one minor correction, which is a library is not a public space, it's a civic space. And the difference being that it's a regulated civic space because one of the values that libraries can bring is making sure that when the community comes in to utilize that facility, there is a moder there's a facilitation that occurs. So it is a civil interaction as well as a civic interaction. Um, and so, and I see nodding, right? And so that's just one, one emphasis. And uh, one other comment before I run, run with my major topic, which is um, we may talk about the conversation of digital broadband, uh, internet broadband being a utility, but that's not in our regulations and that's not how it's being sold and that's not how municipal um, Wi-Fi is, is found it when you know, Comcast sues them 1200 times to stop offering it. I mean, if we, if we truly believe it, and I think we do, we need to now make that into a reality. I think that we're, we're past the time of thinking of places for the internet and we need to think about the internet truly as a universal broadband. Um, and I think that that means that um, the idea that libraries need to change their approach. It used to be come to the library if you don't have access. And now it needs, the library needs to go to Congress, needs to go to the state house, needs to go whatever and say they need it in their home. That this needs to be a truly universal service. Um, and what we found with this pandemic is we have lots of partners to line up with that we never did before. I mean, it's not just schools that sent their students home that found out they didn't have internet access. It was Boeing corporations here in Charleston, South Carolina. It was, you know, major you know, Google sending people home and fi suddenly finding out that they love to live in a rural area and they couldn't afford the internet access. Um, and so we have these partners to make that conversation. But I want to, I, I want to put in one warning. I know I should be more constructive, but the one warning is the last public service standing warning. Um, which is for years, and um, you know, once again, Crosby talked about passport services, talked about neighborhood libraries, talked about um, there are libraries doing meal service um, replacement for virtual schooling. There are libraries that are doing social services, tax services, business startup services. I mean, the idea is what's happened is many state, local, and federal governments have pulled back to internet only resources, and even then, FAQs on a page. And libraries have continuously stood up. They haven't necessarily been resourced to, but they've stood up and said, we, you know, that's our community, we're gonna help. And the problem is if you try and be all things to all people, what eventually you become is not so good at all things to all people. And then we lead right into an ongoing conversation about why, why should we pay for government services that aren't as good as, and fill in the gap here. And so the way to do that, and when you're back to rebuilding, is we do it with partnership. We go to those places that have had to physically pull back because of COVID and we say, you can still do what you need to do through the library, with the library, joining the library. Um, we need to, to look at how we truly re-engage re these two platforms where it is gonna be a while before we're the living room of a community again to hang out physically, but we can talk about how we can hang out online. We can talk about providing that training. We can talk about providing a level of security in doing that. I mean, Zoom, I'm at a university. We loved Zoom right up until they started streaming pornography and anti-Semitic rants into classes because they could Zoom bomb, right? That, that would take, once again, Ben, I'm sorry, I'm seeing, I'm seeing your, your thing and I'm right, face palm, which is, did no one bother to read <laughs> the licensing requirement. Did no one bother looking at the security aspects of this? This is where libraries can, can help doing it. And so I think in five years, the notion of what we're gonna need to start doing now is we've got services going, we've got curbside services going, we've got virtual services going. We've begun to make in a very short time a pretty agile pivot. We have to get, first of all, our house in order. I think there's some really fascinating, really important conversations going on about labor, about, you know, if teachers are having this in school. How can I be safe in this environment? And we need to take those seriously. And then we need to begin with the health and mental health of our communities, which is how do we, you know, how do we begin to be a community again? How do we begin to be physically together again, assuming that we can do that safely? My wife started a second job. My son started back to virtual school. For two days, I was alone in my house. I didn't know how to be alone in my house anymore. Right? We, we're dealing with this idea of how do we knit a community together that is, for all intents and purposes, a really damaged community at this point. Um, and 
that's, that's I think, where we move to get. And we do that through people and making sure that our people are trained and working together to do it. So just a rant to begin. Uh, good, good. You go for it. I hope it's okay to keep jumping in. Um, I had two things I wanted to draw your attention to uh, with regard to the technologies that we're currently using right this moment. Um, I want you to think for a moment about the difference between everybody is together in one place and everybody is away and remote. And then there is the hybrid case. And I can tell you that from experience, the hybrid case is a mess. <laughs> Having some people face to face and some people in uh, you know uh, remote access mode does not work very well. Uh, and I'm, the reason I bring this up is that we're going to have to figure out how to do that. Uh, and so we should be challenging uh, the technology people, including me, uh, now rather than later to figure out how the heck to make that work. Part of the reason that's important is that we've seen that that school from home is actually quite valuable, even though it has its side effects that uh, David mentioned. Um, uh, but we are going to have to figure out how to make the hybrid mode work so the kid who's home because he's sick uh, and can't come to the classroom can still participate adequately. Uh, there's also a huge other big problem, and that's accessibility and serving people with disabilities. That's a general problem. It's a generally very hard problem. Uh, and I think that we need to uh, be very attentive to that because to the extent that online has to substitute for in, uh, in person, we have to make that work a lot better. And to the extent that the libraries uh, want to and would value being able to deliver their services in an online way, uh, we want those services to be useful for everybody. So again, technical challenges that, uh, that need attention. Uh, good. Uh, uh... David's example of a Zoom, you know, we just, we just jumped into it. Why didn't we think about these uh, impacts? Why didn't we plan more? It, it made me think of kind of the internet itself. <laughs> you know, we just plunged into it, right? And uh, we just gave everything over to it and didn't think about so many possibilities that in retrospect seemed obvious to think about. Uh, the point about, uh, you know, the government, uh, the, the library is all things to all people is a good one, uh, David. The, the example keeps coming back to us is related to uh, the, the, uh, the e-government uh, boom. You know, for 20 years, every agency at every level of government has been automating uh, uh, services. And you ask them, well, okay, well, who are those for, by the way? And they go, oh, well, well those are people that are connected. And you go, well, okay, it's one thing for Amazon to offer service to people. It's a different thing for the government only to offer services only to people that are connected without assuring it. And they go, oh, well, yeah. Uh. Well, they can go to the library. Mm -hmm. All right. But did they, say, did they give any of those savings from automation and efficiency over to the library to pick up the slack? No. I think this is maybe actionable, but it's just, you know, one of those pet peeves for me. Sorry. Well, uh, but when, for example, a lot of federal agencies moved to the internet very quickly. And I would love to say it was because of efficiency, but many of it was by bypassing GPO and depository regulations, right? I mean, we have to look at this as a sort of lots of multivariate problem, um, which is the idea that I could now put things online and they weren't, they didn't necessarily have to go to the National Archives. They didn't have to get printed out. They didn't have to create, and that changed levels of transparency within the government. And then we've had to follow up and figure out how do we put those things in place. No. Let's, let's dive into this kind of virtual personal aspect, this duality. Vent uh, mentioned this hybrid model, you know, it's kind of a disaster. Crosby, you know, where do you see libraries playing this both roles? How do they blend those or you know, what, what, are the, what do you expect the impact of that well, to be? I, it, it's, it, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution to, to this, number one. Uh, number two, I think you have to look at subject matter content uh, and, and figure out uh, what that means in both virtual and physical space. So healthcare, um, telemedicine is a big deal right now. Community information is a big deal around it. Community information online makes so much sense. The telemedicine aspect of this is probably going to end up being some kind of hybrid uh, of in-person and, 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 uh, and online. And how that exactly happens, I don't know. I mean, you know, the people are selling watches that, uh, you know, take your temperature and, 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 and your vitals and whatnot. 
and libraries will be the substitute for folks who can't afford the Apple Watch or whatever it is um, uh, for, for actual clinical things, I think. Um, it, libraries may not be the only place or in certain places they may be the only place in big cities there are probably a lot of different places uh, that you can do this Walgreens or CBS um, then education in education in Kansas City we were doing the career online high school um, and that was primarily virtual but had it had a, a, a an in-person uh, aspect to it um, uh, and, and, and then uh, with the MIT uh, Media Lab, we, we did a curated online uh, uh, post-secondary uh, combination of skill development and, and, uh, um, and, and courses that were accredited. Um, and, and that's still in, in experimental mode. It was an IMLS uh, uh, grant, actually, before I got there. And, uh, and that, but that had a big in-person uh, component, something called learning circles and uh, a classroom uh, uh, style. And I think there's gonna be a mixture of all these things uh, that are gonna happen. It's gonna depend on the individual library and the individual city. I mean, what David's talking about with all the social services without resources, uh, believe me, as a, as a library director, I, I experience that all yeah. the time. And, and cities need to become much more focused uh, on, on, on how, how social services are getting uh, are getting to uh, to folks um, uh, because they haven't re really been very focused on uh, on that. Um, so I, I, at the end of the day, I think we have to think uh, in terms of what's the best way in my situation as a library director, as a city manager, as as whatever to to get these services uh, to people in the post pandemic world. I will say this: we're making an assumption about. Uh, the post-pandemic universe being dramatically different than the pre-pandemic universe. And I would urge you to read John Barry's book about the 1918 uh, Spanish flu. Uh, the pandemic was still going on when people were already ignoring the pandemic and going <laughs> back to their uh, to, to pre-1918 uh, activities, um, you know, parades and football games and, and, and everything. And I, I think we're the animal spirits uh, of uh, the human beast is it will come out in in a hurry as soon as we think we're we're really over the 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 curve and 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 library and and I will say this and this is a message I've been I've been giving in in the library and museum world libraries and museums had better be ready for that they had better be ready for the moment when the the, the people in their community want to come back into the library. Um, and and if they're and if they're not, it will be damaging. Mm, mm. Well, the good point on that there there may be a new crisis before this current crisis is over. So we've got a kind of a stack of these things that libraries are playing a role in responding to. Uh, you know, these weather extreme weather events are you know. We've been smoked here for the last two weeks in California. It's been, you know, very unhealthy to hazardous. Just open your window. And, you know, they're underwater in Florida. Uh, you know, we used to call it in the middle of the country tornado alley. Now there's a hurricane alley that seems to be coming up through the Gulf. So there's a lot of circumstances that where libraries seem like they are a natural entity, because they are kind of the Swiss army knife of institutions to play a role in disaster readiness and response. And, uh, and, and they're, they're also kind of, you know, they, their motto is open to all. So they're the place of last resort, the place that everyone thinks of when they can't think of anything else. Well, the, the library will help me with almost anything. I'll just go there. So you're right. Uh, they need to be ready for that. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Vint about a trend we've been uh, seeing everywhere the uh, decentralized web, I think is the term of, of use mm -hmm. and how you can imagine Vint perhaps local libraries becoming service providers in the way we think of the cloud kind of services, you know, providing storage or uh, group app, you know, app licenses like Zoom or those kinds of things. Can you see that? Uh, can you see that trend in libraries emerging in that somehow? To be blunt, no. Let me explain. Um, I, I hear this and see this, and of course, the debate it uh, all over the place. 
The reason I am not persuaded is that it takes serious uh, investment to maintain and operate facilities like that. Moreover, uh, you can't stick with whatever you've got. You have to keep upgrading the equipment to you know, new densities and new capabilities. Uh, and the efficiency of the data centers is hard to overstate. Uh, when you know, we, we increase the uh, capacity of the data centers on a regular basis because we have higher density hardware, we have lower cost uh, memory systems, and yet uh, the number of people required to manage the operation, it doesn't increase at the same rate at which the capacity does, partly because of heavy automation and partly because um, the, the units are, are so efficiently maintained. So. I'm afraid that trying to distribute that across all the libraries with their highly varied budgets and mm -hmm. their highly varied uh, training of you know, personnel uh, capabilities does not add up, in my opinion, either economically or technically. So as attractive as it might seem, uh, I, I just don't see it. Now, I do see a different possibility, and that's that the libraries have access to cloud-based services and they move a lot of what would have been local into a cloud-based environment, mm -hmm. which would be more efficient for them. It also means that you could, if you do it right, you can run across multiple clouds so that, you know, like in the case of Google, uh, we have mechanisms that allow people to run the same program on different clouds other than our own. And so the idea here would be to allow libraries to get access to multiple cloud providers. Uh, I'm sorry if I saw like an advertisement for the Google Cloud service, but I really do believe it is a mistake to imagine libraries undertaking the kind of thing that data centers have to do on a regular basis. So does that mean then invent that, that all these sophisticated, complicated, expensive services will tend to continue to aggregate to the, to the big boys, to the major players? We well, opened the, 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 the uh, topic uh, uh, quoting uh, uh, Macron, uh, president of France, who described uh, two models of the inter internet that he saw or is generally seen to be emerging, you know, the California Silicon Valley model and the Chinese model. Um, is, it, is it just going to be, we're all going to be in the thrall of just either China or, or Google? Well, hang on. First of all, Google wasn't the only uh, service provider in this space. Google, AWS, you know, the whole uh, second, second, uh we're talking about two different things here. The, uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese government wants to control what its users or what its citizens see. It wants to oversee what they do. And it's doing a pretty dramatic uh, job of achieving that objective with machine learning and facial recognition and a variety of other monitoring tools. Something we didn't really think was possible in the early days to control plus, the internet. Plus the great firewall, among other things. So, uh, so they are all about trying to control. Uh, the Western side is trying to keep things open, trying to keep you know, free flow of information, trying to keep information discoverable and shareable. Um, but your question is really not so much about those two ideologies as much as it is about the, um, uh, what do I want to call it, uh, the economy of scale, which is, has demonstrated itself repeatedly. Now, look, there are, there's not just one uh, cloud provider. There are at least three major ones in the U.S. There are major ones in China, although we don't have access to those, generally speaking. And there can be others. Um, and I also have to remind you that companies that were at the top of the heap have disappeared. Uh, Digital Equipment Corporation is gone. Okay. Hewlett Packard is sort of not quite there anymore. IBM is still with us. I mean, it, you know, Yahoo has sort of disappeared along with AOL and a few others. So um, I wouldn't be overly concerned about any current population of large-scale uh, providers, as long as the competition continues. Yeah, if I could jump in for a moment, we don't ask the libraries to to take over the paving of the roads around the library. I mean, infrastructure is different levels of infrastructure need different levels of support. What I'm much more interested in is looking at libraries as they're rebuilding 
taking on questions of data and community data and data maintenance and privacy. That idea of, you know, gathering that facial recognition, gathering that automotive data, gathering what the police are doing with license plate recognition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a, I see. And before, before we jump in, obviously different size libraries are going to have different levels of competency in that. But if we look at libraries playing a role in public data and public information um, protection, storage, dissemination, and policy making. I think that's an important role for libraries to, to jump into. Then you need to distinguish between curation and operation of infrastructure. Yes, I agree. And, and, and otherwise, if, if your argument leads to, therefore, we have to build a data center into the library, that's, no. a, that's a, a simply a, a non-starter, in my opinion. I agree. So no. the, other, the other side of the coin, though, is that most of the uh, cloud providers fully recognize, especially the ones that are starting to engage with enterprises, that the enterprises in which I would include a library as an enterprise wants access to that storage and control over the storage, control over what gets into it, control over who gets access to it and on what terms and conditions. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a library undertaking to do that. Yeah. So Crosby, curation and and management and privacy well, so a, a, a couple of things one I, I would say you know one of the typical things that a library has been doing over the last 20 years is to open a gmail account uh for uh, to teach somebody to get on the internet through a, a gmail account somebody it might be google uh could make uh, could make some money by by creating a, a a storage system specifically for for library patrons at a discounted rate to the uh to the to the libraries uh, to 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 reoffer uh, to the uh, to their patrons, uh, just a suggestion. Um, uh, so I mean, we're already introducing folks to the cloud through through uh, in in libraries through uh, through our uh, uh, services and helping them set up their own accounts, et cetera. Um, in terms of curation, I, I think that's going to be. The, uh, I, I completely agree. And the Kansas City Public Library uh, tried very hard to to uh, to do versions of this. We, we we were particularly interested in getting the truth out about the tax system, uh, you know, tax increment financing and and, and whatnot. The the uh, the shift of uh, uh, of taxing benefits to real estate developers, uh, which was huge in Kansas City. Uh, and and in which the the city was required under uh, uh, accounting national accounting rules uh, to to disgorge this information, but never did. Um, and but w one of the problems there, of course, is that there are various interest groups who want you know want to share and uh, only share in their uh, their own way. Uh, so I, I think I think that I think it's really important. The notion of civic data is a really important thing, and IMLS has been funding some civic data projects, and will can continue to. It's also really complicated and really difficult. Uh, and surprisingly enough, some of the players you would most expect uh, to want, want want to be open, have an open universe, don't really want to have an open universe. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, municipalities run by people who are known as "quote unquote" progressives, um, and and that that I think is 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 the most interesting uh, struggle. The, the single largest check written to a wealthy American was written by Bill De Blasio to Jeff Bezos, three point five billion dollar uh, check to bring Amazon to uh, to New York, uh, and that was essentially a distortion of the tax system in in favor of the single wealthiest. American by the politician most identified as a progressive uh, in our national dialogue. And I, I, I found that as a librarian, the, the single most interesting thing that happened during the course of this presidential campaign so far, and nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about it. I wasn't aware of it. I guess I, I hadn't heard about it. Uh, well, nobody talked about it except the massive amount of protests that were showing up in Brooklyn and when they were talking about placing and began public discourse. And I think one of the roles that libraries talk about, which is um, the idea of empowering communities to advocate on their behalf, that idea of how do we train people, not just in how to use the technology, but how do we identify needs, identify narrative stories, and identify ways of empowering that story moving forward. That is going to be a really tricky point, right? It, that all of it, you said it, Don, which is these are all so inter intertwined. They're, they're not just complicated problems, they're complex problems. 
Um, and it's going to be really important for us to talk about what are the minimum qualifications, right? So what is a, what is a librarian? To me, what's a more interesting question to what a library looks like post-COVID is what a librarian looks like post-COVID. A library is going to look remarkably like a library, but now we've added some plexiglass to it. The librarians who are going to make the decisions about how do we open, how do we train, what are the services we put in, do we open that Gmail account, do we, um, you know, all of these kinds of questions, that's going to be one of the things that we need to prepare for. And um, I think that's the conversation that we have not had elegantly. We've had, we've had it um, recently in the sort of Twitterverse and social sphere around the libraries, but it hasn't really been a matter of talking about what is our ultimate impact that we want to have in that community. Well, that's great that you, you, you brought up two important things. One, kind of the, the social aspect of this, the most difficult part to evaluate and quantify, of course, but yet undeniably important and critical role that libraries play. And then also librarians themselves, which we tend to, you know, talk more about the, the hard stuff and, and not so much about the elegant skills that librarians uh, possess. And David uh, leading a, a library school there at the University of South Carolina is one of the people that we rely on to help guide the development of our new librarians. And so David, what, what skills uh, do you see librarians having, you know, now that they weren't expected to have yesterday? I think that, that what's emerged is we've always talked about libraries as mean, providing means of access. And whether that's in how you organize bookshelves for browsing or whether that means physical programming. We've talked about librarians as organizers of information. That is, how do we take in information and make sense of it? I think the new role for librarians that's emerged over the past five to 10 years that's becoming more important is facilitation. That idea of helping communities, whether they're academic communities, K-12 communities, business communities, have um, productive conversations. How do we identify that? Um, and that became really evident, for example, the other thing that's happened during this pandemic was the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, to see uh, how libraries have had to wrestle with that question, how to wrestle with the potential divisions in their own community and how to have a constructive and difficult conversation around race um, instead of in the past simply saying, that's, that's a political thing or that's not objective or we saw both sides of these things it really has been a conversation about how do you have the professional ethics and capabilities to go into the difficult conversations where people have very legitimate views that are very divergent and bring communities together to say, this is where we need to advocate and what resources we need to put in place. Um, Vince point about the future of, of the libraries, or I'm sorry, maybe it was, it was Crosby. It's not, there's not one future for all libraries. There's lots of futures and lots of diversity within it. And librarians have to be trained to walk into communities and say, what do we need here now? Not how do we make a library because that's this generic cookie cutter idea. So what that suggests to me is, is a skill at facilitating these kinds of community conversations around an array of topics, which reminds me of what Crosby did in Kansas City, talking, convening people to talk about infrastructure, broadband infrastructure, in, without being a subject expert, but being a, a, a generalist that can also manage a conversation. Crosby, you did that. What was that like? Yeah, well, uh, I, and uh, I, I think, you know, we, we penetrated the, the, the community dialogue fairly significantly. And, and, uh, and, and I think the, the recognition of the, the, the need uh, uh, is much greater, greater in the city council, greater in the, in the, in the business community. I still think there, there, there are huge problems in, in getting from where we are to, to, to getting to universal connectivity and universal use. Um, and I, I, we did a, a pretty good job, I think, in, in Kansas City, but we did, you know, the, the increase, Google Fiber came and, uh, and, and connected a, a lot of people, but, you know, something that people really needed to be connected, there's still a huge, a huge gap. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and all the gaps exist, the achievement gap, the economic gaps, the uh, educational uh, educational gaps, the healthcare gaps, et cetera. And we've got to be focused on, and, and, and here librarians, I think, do play a great civic role on the interconnection of all those things. And, and then what are the ways we can work to, to diminish those, those gaps by bringing people together? And, and you know, we, one of the really specific narrow, narrow thing that we did uh, right before I left in Kansas City 
um, is we, we, we had Matthew Desmond, who's the guy who wrote the book on come to the library. I was interested in that because in his book, he compared New York and Kansas City on eviction and Kansas City didn't do well. Um, and we brought him in and then we helped create a project uh, around looking at eviction in Kansas City. Um, and it became an issue in the mayoral campaign, the last mayoral campaign and, and the city council campaigns. And there, it, we passed legislation, not great legislation in my view, but um, uh, it w was an important dialogue that was held in Kansas City. Now, at the end of the day, it was still wasn't as, as focused a, a dialogue as it could, could be because it got into the usual partisanship, sort of the defenders of the, the, the free market and the land, landlords on one side and, and the defenders of the oppressed tenants on the other side. And lost in this was the single most important fact about eviction in Kansas City, which is the single biggest evictor was the Kansas City Public Housing Authority. <laughs> um, and that's still a, a lost factoid, and I'm no, I'm no longer able to participate in the dialogue. Uh, I probably shouldn't even be saying this uh, here, but I'm sure you know everybody's sworn to secrecy, right? Um, is, is that the city itself is the is the biggest evictor, and uh, and and, uh, and and that's a fact that has to be addressed. And yet the city the city itself obviously doesn't really want to address it. The civic community doesn't really want to address it. The business community doesn't want to address it. And, and, and the organized activist uh, committee doesn't want to address it either, apparently. So, uh, you know, it remakes the point that there are a massive range of civic issues that uh, the, the library is relevant to, could be relevant to. But I think underlying all that is the opportunity for libraries and librarians to play this role because they're trusted. No one thinks the library, you know, has a secret agenda other than literacy, maybe. <laughs> and, and, and so this is, this is unique in all of civilization or society is, is having someone as a profession uh, most trusted to, uh, to help people just for the sake of helping people without trying to do something. So this is precious and valuable. And our, our view is that, you know, when after civilization collapses, it will reemerge naturally, as you say, Crosby, you know, the animals in state, but we'll, we'll cluster together in physical proximity to share ideas and stuff. And that's going to look like a library. And even that's probably the last place it falls, I would also say, because they're just so valuable on so many levels. I think that was the uh, plot of Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. So. Seems like, maybe. Yeah. maybe I've got to write it. but it, yeah. Vint, we want to give you the last word here. Uh, we're on the hour. Uh, we can go over a little bit, but, you know. I can't. Yes. I, I have another call that I need to take. But one thing I would add to the librarian's list of things to do is act as a help desk for online services at some point. Everyone will be using them, and they'll turn to the librarians for, uh, for help. Uh, and so that's yet another interesting uh, kind of skill that the librarians will have to learn. Yeah, I think it's one they have. And uh, okay. okay, so we're going to turn you loose. We're going to thank you. And uh, if everybody would unmute, if you got it just a second, everybody unmute, please. Unmute. We'd like to uh, thank our, our speakers today for showing up and giving us all these wonderful insights. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think we can uh, close the recording. And